You are listening to Nakedly Examined Music, a podcast about songs and songwriters. My name is Mark Linsenmeyer. My guest for episode 146 is Nels Klein, perhaps best known as lead guitarist for Wilco since he joined them in 2004. You're right now listening to some of You Are My Face, a song he co-wrote for their 2007 album Sky Blue Sky. But he is also a very accomplished jazz guitarist. We're going to be discussing a song called Headdress from one of his latest albums, 2020's Share the Wealth by the Nels Klein Singers. Then looking back to a solo album of his called Cower 2009, the song is The Nomad's Home. Finally, all the way back to his first solo album, 1987's Angelica, for the song Fives and Sixes. We'll conclude by listening to Imperfect Ten by the Nels Klein Four from their 2018 album Currents, Constellations. For more information, please see NelsKlein.com. For more about this podcast, see NakedlyExaminedMusic.com. If you want to support the effort and get our ad-free feed, go to patreon.com slash nakedly examine music. I will play a little of You Are My Face by Wilco from Sky Blue Sky 2007, as that's one of the few that you have a co-writing credit on that's not just Tweety and the band, it's Tweety and you. The particular instrumental break that comes in a couple times is like, obviously that's your injection, but was that the case that you came up with a B section that he like was prominent enough that you got co-writing credit on or was it, I know you also love the birds or was the whole song a more of a collaboration? Well, interestingly, those chords you're talking about are Jeff's chords. The origin of that piece is a demo that I did. I'm getting that you're aware is the first studio recording by that lineup of the band, which is still the same lineup. Long ago, we assembled to make this record. And one of the things I submitted as an idea was a kind of drone instrumental piece in 5-4 that Jeff liked this one riff in it, but he ended up taking the riff and harmonizing it. And he spent a considerable amount of time just trying out a lot of different chords for what turned out to be that break. And beyond that, I mean, the melody is mine. That thing. And then the, I had no idea this would happen. That whole part, I wrote those chords. So that, whatever you call that section, it's really kind of a B section surrounded by the break, the instrumental break you're describing. The jangly vocal section is totally Jeff, and it was my idea to play 12 string. So, though most people know you maybe from that, we're going to talk all the way back to 1987, but before we're done with this interview, you've been putting out albums for at least that long. That was your first solo album. When did you actually start recording? The first record I was ever on was a record by my good friend and very powerful influence in my life, Mr. Vinnie Golia, multi-woodwind virtuoso and prolific composer. And I'm on his second album, maybe 79. Oh, okay. And then I played with my friend Tim Byrne. Well, we're still friends. And that was 1980, I think. And I'm on half of a record of his called 7X. And then the first record with my name kind of sharing sort of leadership role was do a record with my late friend Eric Von Essen called Elegies. And that was also from 1980. But the first record I did under my own name as a kind of band leader was in 1987. It was recorded and released in 88. We'll get back to there. I want to highlight your most recent stuff first. We've got this giant background going all the way back then with, on your wiki page, it lists 41 albums with you as band leader. (laughs) And I see 30 plus on your page. And then a whole bunch of other groups. We had uh, Big Walnuts Yonder that have highlighted on the show before and some other things. But the most recent record, Share the Wealth, 2020, by the Nels Klein Singers. Can you say a little about that project before we get to the song Headdress that we were going to highlight from that? To address all these recordings you're talking about, a lot of them are just collaborations with improvisers, uh, accidental recordings that somebody says, can I release this? The, The live recording came out really good. And I say, okay, sure. You know, so... There aren't that many where I'm the actual leader, like songwriter, dude. But certainly the new one, Share the Wealth, is one of the leader, dude records. And it's the new expanded lineup for my band, The Singers, which this month, Scott Amendola, the drummer who's been playing with me this whole time, informs me is the 20th anniversary of the Nels Klein Singers, which started out as a trio and is now a sextet. 
I got together with, with Scott and Trevor Dunn on bass and Cyril Baptista. We had been playing as a quartet for a while, but I then added Brian Marcello on multiple keyboards and Skerrick on tenor saxophone and electronics to see what would happen, I guess, about over a year ago or so. The results were rather stunning to me, particularly in terms of the improvising. My initial impulse was to take a lot of improvising and very severely edit it and collage it in a way to create this kind of very kaleidoscopic, psychedelic, maybe jarring listening experience. But I also had written some ballads. And so we tried out some material for a couple of days and did some improvising and ended up with a, another long record by yours truly. And the song Headdress is very smooth. It's intentionally smooth. It's a little distorted, but it's smooth. And I really like smooth, kind of groovy driving songs. And this kind of fits that. The inspiration for the song is probably pretty vast if I think about it. But specifically at the time, I was really thinking a lot about my love of my friend Jeff Parker's records, the great guitarist and composer and producer Jeff Parker, particularly his new breed recordings. And my wife, Yuke, and I are really quite infatuated with this Esperanza Spalding 12 Little Spells record and the performances that she did, uh, we got to see. And there's a song called Touch in Mine from that uh, that was kind of also resonating and ringing in my head when I wrote Headdress. So Headdress starts out with a little, in Indian classical music, we might call an alap section, which is a drone with me improvising rather relaxed. And then it goes into what you'll hear as the main theme and a nice tenor saxophone moment for Skerrick.
So that initial drone with the guitar line, do you think in terms of modes, is this, it sounds vaguely Arabic. Do you know what you're playing there? Well, I think it's just a pure minor. We're looking at an Aeolian situation, nothing too exotic. But yes, I do think in terms of modes quite often, and I really enjoy exploring, for example, like a Mixolydian with a sharp five, it's really a flatted fourth, I guess, but scales and with different emphasis so that the bass note is not, say, like if it's C7 sharp five, it's not C, it would be maybe let's try A flat as the bass note and just explore that scale. And I just sit around doing that. I wasn't really trained on the guitar, but I did have some theory wonderful theory teacher at one point in my life named Rule Beasley, who showed me some things. And then this man, Eric Von Essen, who I mentioned earlier from a 1980 recording called Elegies, was kind of my musical partner for almost 17 years or so. And he was a true musical genius and was playing his music and playing with him that showed me much of the language that I still use in my own music and which we were deriving inspiration from to use from people like Ralph Towner and Keith Jarrett and John Abercrombie and Richie Byrack and people like that. So that initial part was that entirely free rhythmically? So you didn't even have some kind of pulse in your head that you were reacting to in subtle ways? (laughs) Just wanted to create a, a nice introductory space and then sort of take you by surprise and launch into a distorted, smooth song. And in terms of what the actual drone was, I mean, obviously there was some guitar swishing in there um was this something you created on a loop you know yes. with pedals okay so so you're not relying on somebody else to hold down the the fort or hitting the one keyboard note or something you're well, just creating that environment yourself that you can dispel at will exactly what i did but although with brian marcella and the band i could have easily asked him to do some kind of like lush drone and i don't know why i didn't actually but he did a few lush drones elsewhere on the recording <laughs> <laughs> well, it has the effect then when you finally introduce the full band that, okay, now we have the sustained organ that wasn't there before. So it's a nice change in tonal palette. I do want to play that little transitional three chord section getting into that. Yeah, so that's the place where I would say you're entering the Pat Metheny jazz world for a second there. But if, if you could interpret it as just psychedelic, we're moving to a different land with these three chords. It was a studio creation. What I did okay. was insert with my friend Eli Cruz, who engineered the record and co-produced. And we've done a lot of things together. And he's really fast and brilliant. And so we had such fun making up this stuff. But I just wanted to connect the section in a way that I guess is a little bit like what I was describing my original design for the record was to have all these little tidbits that were collaged together to create this kind of kaleidoscopic listening experience. In this case, I just did a descending kind of diminished thing and put it in reverse in a loop. And the delay on it is with my chaos pad. It's just the stuff I always have set up next to me when I have my big setup, which I do for the singers and I do for Wilco. So I just, you know, imagined the tempo in my head and just created this and then ran it backwards and asked Eli to record it and insert it. And it worked really quite well, I think. So then the the jam itself with the bass and drum, was that just a group improv? No, oh, no, it's a tune I wrote. I mean, the drum pattern and the bass line and all the chords and melody, that's all my song called Headdress, essentially. And everything leading up to that is just an intro. And what is with the, <laughs> that's a crazy choice for that snare on here to have it just sound completely distorted (laughs) yeah well i wanted it to be really rough but also bearing in mind what you hear quite often on singers records is their live performances that have been captured and even all the electronic sort of manipulation is also done in real time so in this case it should be noted that scott amandola uses pedal board and has been since the beginning of the band He was using it when I formed the singers. And as I recall, way back when, he was unable to find anybody who would let him use it on a gig. (laughs) So I said, well, bring it, and we're going to use it. And he just does remarkable things with it. And it's always going. He always has something going on with it. But we just run it into its own channel. And then if we want to use it, we use it. And if we don't, we don't. And in this case, it was perfect. 
for what I was imagining, this really kind of grainy, but not harsh, like ragged. Well, just like the snare is a little busted on the bottom of the snare. Really, he's coming through his pedal board, and he sure he was using some kind of distortion. And I think Trevor was using an octave pedal on his bass. And then as you hear the, the song end, we gradually remove Scott's pedal board track, and it becomes a clean snare and bass drum right at the very end, where you just hear Scott and Trevor by themselves. Okay, I thought he was playing with organ. So, okay, so that's just an octave or something that he's harmonizing himself on the bass. Exactly. And then right at the end, I'm just doing live looping. Everything else you hear is live on the song. Okay, so all the little percussion intrusions. So that's Ciro Batista playing a color. Very sparsely, like it sounds more like these were studio overdubs. Let's put in a little clava here. But then I saw you guys, I, I was watching a live video of, no, that's actually how it works, that he has so much stuff on stage that it's getting... Ciro's always bringing the magic. Let me move to 225. This is after the sax has been in a while. Do you even think of this in terms of A section, B section, C section? I mean, the drums have moved double time. We're doing some different chords here. We're moving forward here. Just a little bridge, you know, nice little B section. The saxophone solo is just in the C minor. And, and then we just expand out of it, go back to B. The song's super simple. Yeah, well, I see that that whole thing is only about 20 seconds long. And then it kind of has another of those three chord, not as trippy as your first <laughs> three chord transition, but gets us back to the to the A section. I found it interesting how you were, the sax is taking it a lot of the rest of the song, I guess at least for another minute or so after that, but you start to interact with it a little more on guitar, that you're kind of picking at it as not to the point of a, a duo, but you're introducing, what is that, the bubbling sound that you're doing on guitar? That <laughs> Yeah, well, while he's playing, I'm beginning a loop, and the loop okay. is going through the chaos pad, but when I'm using my my old 16-second digital delay that I've had, well, not the same one, because they keep breaking, but started this in 1985 when Bill Frizzell showed me his, and we were in a band together for a minute there, touring in Europe with Julius Hemphill, and I had to get one of these things, and I've been completely addicted to it. He's still the master of this thing, but he hasn't used it since his broke uh, decades ago. So what I'm doing, though, while Skerrick is playing is I'm not just creating a loop based on what I'm the notes that I'm playing. I'm also, how can I say, without using the verb jiggling? Well, I mean, basically, I'm, basically, I'm switching the octave switch on it while I'm playing so that when it get when I bring the loop in, you'll hear the octave bouncing. And while the octave is bouncing, it's also going into the chaos pad delay, which is creating this rather sparkly kaleidoscopic sound and that's what you hear also at the end i just faded up and faded down while scott and trevor are vamping out so was it that the pedal board on the drums that you were saying that there's sort of a separate that you've got your clean track and you've got your effect track and oh no this is just whatever happens happens <laughs> yeah exactly but i like the results are you even having to play more than one note <laughs> you know that it's the pedal that's doing the the flicking in your yeah, I just play one note okay. or I play a chord or a dyad or uh, whatever that I think might be a good addition to to the loop. And I've been doing it for a long time. It's almost like a grotesque habit at this point, I suppose. Well, let's get a second song out on the table. The Nomad's Home. This is from the Coward record, 2009. This is a true solo record with, I see, looking at the credits for the whole album, you have a variety of things, a zither, an auto harp, a Mega Mouth, a, oh, the Chaosolator, I guess that's what we were just talking about, the Saruti box, but I don't think we're going to hear most of that on this one. This seems like slide guitar and acoustic, and that's it. No, Coward is a, a an overdub record, as we say, uh, wherein I deign to play all string instruments with a few exceptions, uh, Shruti boxes, which are the Indian drone boxes, and the Chaosolator, in this case, is a little tiny, sort of the size of a really large cell phone that uh, Korg was making back then, and I used it for fake choir and for a drum machine 
sound on one song, a movement from the Onan suite on the record. And everything else is acoustic and electric guitars. I sort of limited myself by not playing percussion. I didn't use my voice to sing anything. I just really wanted it to be mostly string instruments. Much of the record is somewhat, if not very generously, microtonal. So I'm exploring certain overtones and resonance of string instruments to basically, I guess, entertain myself and the world, possibly. I guess I should say that this song is a duo. It's just a duet between nylon string guitar and a uh, square neck dobro slide. So this seems very through composed. Can you say a little about the process of putting, you've got some consistent themes, but then each time you introduce them, like you've got different harmonies on them. You're doing something to make it so like when the second time it comes back, it's a little spookier. <laughs> it's a little thicker. I chose this because I was short, number one, and number two, because there's a certain sensibility about it that maybe a lot of people don't hear from me. And the song was written, it's called The Nomad's Home. 
because it was written while I was thinking about a, a very good friend of mine, and she went off to really rather very specifically designed nomadic existence playing her music and really stopped living anywhere for a long time, which is a very fatiguing thing to choose to do. I know a few musicians who made this choice at certain points in their life, and it can be very taxing, even alienating. But anyway, I missed her. And so I thought that calling a piece The Nomad's Home was a fun paradox because a true nomad doesn't have a home, but also because it could mean the nomad is home, meaning home where we were both living and where she's from and where I'm from, which at the time is Los Angeles. And so the song starts out with a, a, a mood that I would say is like maybe perhaps a little pensive, maybe a little bit, I, I hate to use as simple a term as sad or wan, but it, it strives for that. And it's a simple melody that repeats twice, but the second time there is a lot more adventurous harmonic content. So I reharmonized it. I wrote the piece in the studio. This record was recorded entirely in my dear friend uh, Mark Wheaton's studio in Los Angeles called Catasonic, which is in his house. It's just a tiny space in the basement of his house. So I did the whole thing, recorded and mixed in five days, pretty much for myself to continue, I guess, what I was saying. <laughs> the piece then ramps up at the end with an extended coda that starts out as a kind of two chord vamp with me referring, I guess, touristically, but earnestly to Hindustani slide guitar playing, which I adore, and uh, Indian classical music in general is pretty much my, my first big musical inspiration since I was 10 years old. So I do a little reference to that, and as it speeds up, I go full-on trad American and end on a, on a happy note, on a nice, I think, C major chord, which is because the nomad is home and I'm happy. Okay, so that is connecting. The theme is <laughs> we're traveling, we're coming home. It definitely, we got the down home flavor at the very end, but using like this Indian playing a sitar like tone with the dobro there to then break into, you know, 30 seconds later, what sounds like a standard lap steel riff, like is a, <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard that transition before. That is <laughs> pretty interesting. Well, I mean, it's me. I have to say there is something very me about that, but it's really coming from, a, uh, I guess, this kind of programmatic place of trying to start out with this loneliness and end up feeling rather celebratory. Well, let me also play a section right near the beginning. So, I mean, th this almost classical riff that you start out with, I mean, you're playing it on a nylon, so that's going to have that connotation, but that has a certain, it's it's within the, the folk realm. And a lot of the melody that you choose here, like this could be an instrumental break on a Wilco song, maybe. But there's one little exception around, so I'm going to start around close to 20 seconds. You kind of come in the third time with your riff, and then we enter... The jazz chords, the Pat Metheny chords, to kind of have this settle down where we sound a lot more like headdress, which I feel like even when you're doing the, what I was calling the spooky harmonies, you know, the thick harmonies later in the song, are not quite from the same harmonic background. I don't know. How do you think of this in terms of what you were doing? The theme repeats that it's reharmonized, and the reharmonization is it's rather dissonant, and it's intentionally dissonant, and it's just to, I guess, ramp up a certain kind of darker mood, which is dispelled at the end of the song. This is, to me, much more coming out of, I guess it's a chamber music aesthetic that I sort of go to a lot when I think about some of my favorite composers, some of whom are you know, European classical composers like Maurice Ravel or Bela Bartok. And so I just wanted to take a simple melody and reharmonize it in an interesting way. The reharmonizing part that introduces the, the dissonance
that's a kind of thickening of the chords you could even hear in a Tom Waits song or something. You know, a lot of chords of the, the gritty guitar that you are known for, what his Mark Rebo is his, his guy that kind of does that cranked, <laughs> really trashed out sound. But having those methane chords in there, that's not introducing dissonance. That's a different kind of softness that seems to just come from a different, a different tradition, let's say. Whereas so much of the rest of it, it could be within that general rock, you know, extended rock folk palette. I think folk music, if we need to, to, you know, go to these sort of bags, that it's a folk song. It's a folk song that I reharmonized. And the chords you're describing as coming from Pat Metheny world, certainly I love Pat Metheny. And he's uh, an influence since he was playing with Gary Burton when he was 19 and I heard him. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's important. But these chords also come from not just European classical music, but they come from Duke Ellington and they come from a lot of... If we listen to, for example, British composers that used English folk song as the gym, jumping off point, like Ralph Vaughan Williams, just a nice fl- kind of full-flavored... <laughs> extension of the harmony that's not dissonant okay it's just that poignance and that kind of resonance that i i aspire to in a lot of my own music and then this place i'm going to play about 150 in Again, I keep kind of looking for, is this, is this the chorus? <laughs> Let's see. Oh, no chorus. There's no chorus. I mean, I guess there is. It's da, 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 da. No, this is the coda. Okay. So, all right. This is when we go to the Lydian mode, which is, as we know, those of us in, the, in modal land, one of the most, if not the most poignant modes, and certainly something that I uh, am probably guilty of abusing, using too often. Well, yeah, well, it's a nice kicker of the plaintiveness of the... Melody, before you go into the... Uh, My rave up. Yes. <laughs> and it's also the signals the end of dissonance in the, that, that we had just traveled through. Let me play a little, little bit in the middle of that end part. 317... I get the feeling somewhere in between when you go full on slide and when you're doing the the very sitar thing that you would have liked to have be able to move your fingers around. <laughs> it's trying to do some melody, but it's so limiting in terms of what notes you can actually. If I was a Hindustani slide master, it'd not be a problem, <laughs> but I am not. <laughs> or snake finger. Clarence White, wouldn't he like put a slide on one finger, but then still... Well, this thing's sitting on my lap, you know. All right. It's, <laughs> it's a square neck dobro, and I don't play with finger picks. So, yeah, it's, you know, I'm not, Clarence White was a genius, you know. I'm no genius. So, <laughs> it's like, Well, this is a really good, uh, you know, accessible. I'm glad you picked this one. Let's stop and talk about our sponsors. Thanks to Nebbia for, again, sponsoring the show. Their Nebbia by Moen Spa Shower is Nebbia's most advanced shower yet, with twice the coverage and half the water use of standard shower heads, it uses 45% less water, yet has a spray that is 81% more powerful than the competition with atomized droplets that rinse shampoo and conditioner out of even the thickest air. This atomization is what really makes it feel like you're in a spa, that the water is all around you. I'm so used to standing in a shower and having to kind of rock back and forth to, to keep coverage, and you don't have to do that with this. So it is very luxurious, very relaxing. And is it easy to install? Yes, it is. You don't need a plumber. You could probably do it in 15 minutes or less. And not only do they have this amazingly engineered shower, which was designed by former Tesla, NASA, and Apple engineers who spent years researching and developing this, but they've given similar attention to a bath mat. They sent me one of these. It is super nice, soft and plush, non-slip, made from reclaimed cotton, treated with an antimicrobial finish to limit germ buildup. There are lots of other accessories too. Just go check it out because your shower, your bathroom, these have been your good friends during the pandemic and they deserve an upgrade, a reward as do you. The Nebbia by Moen Spa Shower starts at just $199 and for nakedly examined music listeners, we have a deal for you. The first 100 people to use the code NEM at Nebbia.com will get 15% off all Nebbia products. Go to Nebbia.com slash NEM. That's N-E-B-I-A dot com slash NEM to check out what they have to offer. 
The first 100 people to use the code NEM with them checking out will save 15% off all Nebbia products. Again, that's nebbia.com slash NEM and use that code NEM to save 15%. Now, you may be a little weary of me telling you incessantly about Masterclass. So this time I want to tell you about a service that gives you over 100 classes from a range of world-class instructors invited right into your ears, into your computers, your TV, however you want to get it any time at your own pace. Oh, this is Masterclass again. Yes. And you've probably heard about some of the individual courses on here. Like if you're enjoying this interview with Nels, you would love Herbie Hancock's Masterclass because I doubt I'm going to be able to get Herbie on this podcast. And you can learn an enormous amount from a master musician like that. So you might think of buying it as a one-off, but I urge you to look at the annual all-access pass, which is $180 for the entire year. You're going to find once you check out their catalog, there's just something for everybody in your family and just more and more that you're going to want to dip into. This week, among the music courses, I looked at the one by Questlove, teaches music curation and DJing an approach to music that is fairly foreign to me. And so his introduction to the technology, his way of listening to music, just the whole DJ approach I found really useful, fascinating, informative. And this is very typical of the Masterclass experience. You go in because there's somebody like Danny Elfman is one of my idols. So I was very excited to hear him talking about creating movie soundtracks. But as I've gotten in there, I found more and more and more and so many things you can surprisingly apply to what you actually do. So yes, even as a songwriter, Ron Howard or David Lynch talking about directing or Joyce Carol Oates or Margaret Atwood talking about writing, these are all creative endeavors that have to connect with an audience. The more influences you get in your head, the better you will be at what you do. So Masterclass really has a wonderful formula of delivering this kind of stuff to you. It includes not only the video lectures, which you can listen to as audio instead if you want, at whatever speed you want, at whatever pace you want. They're typically broken down into 10-minute chunks. So they're very much something you can fit into your life. But there's also beautiful downloadable guides, lesson recaps, supplementary materials, sheet music in a lot of cases. And there's a chance to interact with other people that are experiencing the same course. I have advertised for Masterclass for well over a year, and I'm still getting new interesting things every time I have to turn back to it to record another ad. So I highly recommend you check it out, get unlimited access to every masterclass. And as a nakedly examined music listener, you get 15% off an annual membership. Go to masterclass.com slash examined. That's masterclass.com slash examined for 15% off masterclass. Let's go back to that first album. We're going to make a giant leap now to 1987's Angelica. The song you picked was fives and sixes. I wanted to save this to later because it is a longer song. (laughs) It's nearly 11 minutes, much more in a traditional jazz tonality, right? I was calling it Pat Metheny just because he's the first guy that like would do that on guitar that I know about. But of course, you know, there's, there's so much 60s and 70s. Yeah, 50s and 60s, Miles Davis. All those folks coming out of Duke Ellington and things influenced. I don't know. Can you say a little about where you were at this with this initial album? It at least sounds, I see it's only five piece, but the effect is like, oh, I'm playing, this is with the full band. (laughs) This is a little bit of a produced track. You know, I did something last night, which I had not done, which is I actually listened to this record. And I realized that maybe the opening track on the record might have been a better choice just because the opening track is a, it's definitely not jazzy, but it's also was created as sort of introduction to the to the orchestra as i call it the introduction to the band we all get a little moment and the opening track is called angel of death so of course we're off to a very bright and uh, happy start but fives and sixes i chose because i really do like the writing i wanted to talk about the individuals on the record and i also wanted to talk about what i was thinking about when i wrote the piece because it says something about i guess sort of about me in a sense that people aren't aware of and it was kind of stunning Last night when I realized and played some of this while my wife was making dinner and we discussed it, that I was 31 when I made this record. And boy, that seems young right now. (laughs) I'm doing 65 now. So this record was done for a very reputable German jazz label called Enya. The intention of my Enya thing was to start with this record. It was going to be a trilogy of records was to start with this record, which was intentionally coming from a a more so-called inside musical space that's influenced by a lot of seminal jazz artists that I love and sort of move into the trio that I was doing a year or two later, which was much more, uh, I guess, one would hear even from my band, The Singers, which is this kind of mixture of rock, 
sensibilities, you know, a little more, it's a little tougher, noisier, and a trio. So I don't remember now what the second recording that was going to br- make the bridge to my trio was, but uh, we ended up going straight to the third of the trilogy <laughs> and doing a record called Silencer with my first trio. So this record was supposed to symbolize, in a way, my love of and uh, and be an homage to certain musicians and certain songs and things that I loved. And every song on the record is dedicated to somebody, except for the opener, Angel of Death, <laughs> which I guess is pretty obvious what that's about. So fives and sixes, the piece we're going to hear, a little bit elaborate, and it's a little bit of a production number in that there's some overdubbing on it, which I... I'm actually happy about now because it enabled me to feature my beautiful uh, and late friend Eric playing his chromatic harmonica while he's playing bass, which he couldn't have done in real time. So the song is dedicated to the remarkable trumpet player Booker Little, one of my favorite, not just trumpet players, but composers who died at age 23. He made a huge impact in the, the few years that he was playing and writing. His partner in crime was Eric Dolphy. Quite often they played together. Booker became noticed playing with Max Roach. There are some elements of this song that are very specific to Booker Little's composing language, like the use of certain minor ninth chords, tempo changes, and not necessarily 4-4 four, four time. So it starts out, uh, I'm playing a acoustic steel string on this, and I overdubbed an electric guitar solo. Stacy Rolls is playing trumpet. Tim Byrne is playing alto saxophone. Uh, my twin brother, Alex Klein, is on drums. And the man, Eric Von Essen, that I keep mentioning, is on acoustic bass and chromatic harmonica. So Eric, he passed away in 1997. Stacy, I'm not sure when she passed away. Stacy, I think, is somebody who I wish more people heard. I wish more people talked about. She was the daughter of the amazing pianist Jimmy Rolls, jazz pianist, one of my favorite musicians of all time. Stacy's strength was not really playing the kind of thing I asked her to play on this song, which was kind of more of a, a very straight and uh, very bright, loud trumpet solo. She was really great at this kind of Art Farmer style, really, really mellow, beautiful melodic trumpet and flugelhorn, which she does elsewhere on the record. These were all Los Angeles people. She was in Los Angeles, just kind of scuffling around and just never got the credit she deserved as being such a marvelous player. And then Tim Byrne, who went on to, well, he was already doing tons of important stuff in the 80s as his, his own music. He's still making incredible records and writing amazing music and playing alto saxophone. And at this time, nobody had heard Tim play anything that sounded even remotely straight ahead, which you will not hear him playing straight ahead on this. I actually wanted him to play this wild duet with my brother Alex playing percussion while I play the opening chord vamp as a reference to Eric Dolphy's presence on, say, the Booker Little record out front, one of my favorite recordings of all time. And also just to refer to the collaboration that existed between Eric and uh, Booker. And my brother, Alex, he's just swinging his butt off and playing uh, prepared drums, playing straight ahead, beautiful swing drumming. And uh, does he have a timpani next to him? I mean, it really gets low. (laughs) It's a constant bass drum. Okay. It's horizontal rather than vertical on a stand like you would see in an orchestra. So he hits that thing a couple of times. And boy, that was fun to master back in the vinyl days. I think you can hear the influence of Charles Mingus in the way tempo is manipulated, time signature change. And it's just a sincere tribute to this amazing musician, Booker Little. The chord changes are really hard to play over, too.
But you have this really nice anchor, this usually in five guitar part that is just I actually started by accident charting out one of the other tunes on here, Maria Alone. And I was like, I can't follow this. I don't know. <laughs> it's hard for me. But this one, because of that riff and the fact that it's going fives and sixes, it's going from that riff that's in five to the, the fast sixes part. And then, OK, well, now it's a fast part, but it's still in five. And that, you know, the, the fact that you're playing with those makes it easier for me to, to signpost and having these very distinct. OK, well, this is the the harmonica section. And now we're going to have the Eric Dolphy sax section near the end, which I'm glad you said that name. I was thinking Ornette Coleman, but yeah, Eric Dolphy, that's the guy that. Well, just so you know, Maria alone, because you keep mentioning Pat Metheny, I would say that there is something very distinct about that song that has a lot to do with what Pat was writing around the time of his first record, Bright Size Life, which is still my favorite record of his. And it was a huge influence on me. And there's no doubt listening to that uh, and me listening to my attempt at negotiating my own chord changes almost really barely successfully, that that record is somewhere in there. You can hear the, the influence of Ralph Towner and John Abercrombie and Pat Metheny. And just so you know that when, when the record after this came out, it was called Silencer by the Nels Klein Trio on Enya. My brother listened to it and said, like, all right, dark size life. <laughs> on this Dolphy thing, let me play a little bit from about 9.39 here in the middle of the, the sax solo here. So I wrote, that's where the muted trumpet comes in. The sax has already been going for a while with this duet with your brother on percussion. And I wrote, muted trumpet adds some dignity. <laughs> but there's still, but it's just the fact that, <laughs> that there's... A recapitulation of the opening theme. Yes. It's also doubled with chromatic harmonica, by, by the way. Oh, okay. It's such a startling, you know, when the chromatic harmonica solo is just so mellow, that then this Eric Dolphy-esque howling saxophone is coming in over it and making these squeaky noises. <laughs> well, I mean, it's an extreme version <laughs> as far as the reference to Eric's presence on Booker's mu in Booker's music, but just the way it went down. Yeah. I didn't tend to do those specific things, but I was really pleased with what he did. And, and it's also stunning to hear him play really some very inside saxophone on the rest of the record, which, as I mentioned, that nobody had heard him play like this. At the time, his music is pretty avant-garde in its own right and continues to be. But he also has such a remarkable sound on the alto saxophone, and it did from the very beginning. My brother Alex met Tim because Tim was sort of the, uh, an assistant to this wonderful woodman player and composer, Julius Hemphill. And my brother played with him when he was like 21, 22 years old. And eventually I ended up playing with Julius as well with Alex in his electric band called the Jaw Band, as in Julius Arthur Hemphill. But Tim was all, just an alto player at that point. I mean, Julius was playing soprano and flute and primarily alto, but he had this incredible sound and still does. And I just wanted to exploit it in a way that would reveal to a lot of people who thought of him as just an avant-garde player that he had this amazing lyrical potential in his sound. And sorry, is he playing Barry on this? Like, there's some pretty low just notes. Alto. Okay, uh, okay. Just some subtones, I guess, in there. Gotcha. So I guess the, the anchoring riff in the first place, are you changing it throughout? I thought I, I heard like around 30 seconds. Let me hear. It sounds like you revoice the riff like we were talking about in the last song where you kind of make it a little more dissonant, add a few more undertones. Is that actually just an overdubbed bass note? That, like it's just bass and and the, the different emphasis there. But I'm just playing major, minor, major, minor, major, minor. It's a just another obsessive examination of the relationship between major and minor. <laughs> Something that my friend Bill Frizzell is so incredibly uh, genius at investigating, manipulating, and and uh, illuminating. I would say. And it's part of the blues, you know, it's just like that aspect of the blues. 
I think that this guitar major minor thing, if I'm not mistaken, I might have kind of lifted the directness, the simple directness of it from Igor Stravinsky piece, but I just can't remember now what piece. Otherwise, I would completely out myself. So the chords do change not too far after that. This is 49 seconds in. So these melodies were all charted, right? This was part of the composition. Yeah. Do you know what structurally is going on there that you've been rooted on this major minor thing and now you're going to move something where the horns are carrying you forward a little bit, ever closer to the fast part, which is not for another 30 seconds. I have the music in a box behind (laughs) me somewhere. It's been a long time since I looked at it. Basically, I'm just trying to write a song. I think that that that, that line, da 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 is a very, very blatant reference to Charles Mingus. And Charles Mingus loved Eric Dolphy, and their collaboration is legendary. And as I guess was often the case with Mingus, didn't exactly end happily, but Mingus was a very intense dude. No, I'm just trying to write a song with, with a certain feeling, and I write primarily on the guitar. And I just sat down, and I still do it the same way. I write everything by hand, and I don't use a computer to assist me in transposing things, which is a huge pain in the butt. So... I try to write and play with people who play in concert. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) Well, I remember that that being my very first band, that we had an alto sax player instead of a lead guitarist. And I'm trying to write out guitar solos of Cars songs (laughs) and like transpose them for my alto player friend. (laughs) Ridiculous. You should have just told him to take the record home and learn and save yourself some trouble. He, yeah, he's too much of a marching band guy to <laughs> put, put music in front of him. Let, let's <laughs> keep moving forward here a little structurally. Just uh, So this is, a. Uh, I want to get kind of into this transition. This is 120 or so. All right, so there we go. So we finally open it up. I don't know enough about jazz to know, I you know, like, okay, here's the head, and now we're going to solo, and then we're back to the head. That was like from my high school jazz band experience. But when we go into a do 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 da da do do like that's carrying us forward, do you know what kind of part of the song that is, or does it matter? Well, I mean, it doesn't really matter. Just think of the whole thing as the head. Sure. And then we just take parts of it and, and use them as a sort of a structure for improvisation later in the song. So, for example... Stacy and I have to play over the six eight changes, and actually Eric has to play through both the five four and the six eight sections because the transition happens during his harmonica solo, and then Tim gets to do really whatever he wants and not even think about pitches if he doesn't want uh, in his duet with Alex, while the rest of us just stay with that five four thing. Right. So you have the whole. It goes through the whole thing again with harmonica. And then sort of uh, moving forward to 402, where we're approaching your solo here. So you're actually soloing over the five. This is an actually new section, right? No, it's the same change for the 6-8 section. And I'm just soloing over those. Yeah, I don't know what I was thinking. So much of this record has chord changes i can barely even solo over now probably and i was 31 then so it's actually very surprising when we get to about six minutes in where we actually have like a regular old walking bass line we're <laughs> we've had this very d- definite bass riff throughout and now, okay, now we're just full on traditional. What were you telling her to channel trumpet wise in, in this solo? Oh, I wasn't telling her anything. So I just gave, put these changes in front of her. There's actually a pretty funny story about this. Her father, Jimmy Rolls, is absolutely one of my favorite musicians. He had played piano with Billie Holiday and, and played with Ella. And he, and he used to be able to sit next to Duke Ellington on stage to study what he was doing. And he was kind of this... Uh, hipster guy he did a bunch of records early on that were very mos allison ish where he's doing like hipster kind of growly singing and but he had 
just this amazing piano approach. And he was just somebody, and he wrote a, one of the most beautiful pieces ever, a very Billy Strayhorn influenced piece called The Peacocks, which became rather well known on a Stan Getz record that Stan did with Jimmy. But anyway, Eric and Stacy and Jimmy used to play together quite a lot. And I used to go hear them play quite often. Uh, there was a restaurant in West Hollywood called Linda's that had some of the best pianists and jazz just playing at the dinner hour where a bunch of people were eating and talking. You could go hear Tom Garvin or Alan Broadbent or Jimmy Rolls playing piano, which was pretty insane. And I met Stacy because I was playing in the 80s with Charlie Hayden's Liberation Music Orchestra, West Coast. He had moved to the West Coast to be near his daughters and his ex-wife and Ellen and just be involved with their growing up. And Charlie, being one of my musical idols, I certainly never thought I would play with, but I played nylon string with him really the whole time he had the Liberation Music Orchestra West Coast in, from maybe 83 to 86 or something, 87, I don't remember. And we did some duo stuff and trio things. But one of the original trumpet players in Liberation Music Orchestra is my friend and inspiration, Bobby Bradford, who played cornet. Oscar Brashear was the other trumpet player who's a really blazing, intense trumpet player. And Bobby has that more kind of dulcet. He was best known for his work with Ornette in the early Ornette days and the later Ornette days. Don Cherry being the most famous collaborator with Ornette. Bobby had gone into the army. And so Don came in. But Bobby quit the Liberation Music Orchestra and Charlie hired Stacy Rolls. And I was amazed by this and extremely pleased. And we became friends pretty much right away. And I thought it was a brilliant choice because Stacy, like Bobby, had a much more intimate sound on her instrument. So when I asked her to do this record, she was a little hesitant because a little outside her comfort zone stylistically, as was the Liberation Music Orchestra. But she was game. But she didn't play the record for Jimmy, her dad, for I think maybe a, almost a year because she was afraid he would be upset because it wasn't straight ahead, like straight ahead jazz, you know? So she told me, she thought that, that he would listen to it and get angry and say like, you're not playing straight ahead. And so he was over to her, her house at one point, apparently, and there was a cassette. We're talking, of course, 87 here. There was a cassette of the finished mixes that I had sent to her sitting right on the table when Jimmy was saying, so how'd that record go with Nels? What does it sound like? You know? And she was like, putting it aside, putting her hand over it. And you're like, oh, I don't know. I haven't heard it back yet. Uh, uh, uh. But then Jimmy finally heard it when it came out for real. She got brave enough to give him, I guess, a copy of it. And he ended up really, really liking it. But the fun thing about that is that he called me up and left a message on my phone machine back when we had phone machines. It was something to the effect of, Alice, Jimmy Rolls, that record you did with Stace, I really liked it. What kind of music is that? Not jazz, but it's okay. <laughs> it was something like that. <laughs> and this was, I mean, literally Jimmy Rolls, I think, is one of the greatest, for me, one of the greatest musicians I've ever heard. It's just something so amazing about Jimmy to me. And I just am so blown away that he liked it at all. <laughs> well, and it's not jazz because, you know, I completely, this is just the level of my knowledge of jazz, which I, I should say, I went through a long period of listening to every single Miles Davis and everybody that played in his band like that, you know, so I have some functioning knowledge of jazz, but I don't really understand what happened after the eighties with it, <laughs> that it sort of, it got, got into this fusion, which, you know, has a very limited appeal and was affected by synths. And then eventually seemed to get cured of that just by sonically. But, the uh, thing started in the seventies. <laughs> And there was so much jazz in the 80s and after that had nothing to do with fusion because that's when the, the new traditionalists... Right, became, exactly. And that became a kind of straight-ahead jazz, like hard bop and bebop-infused acoustic jazz came back. You know, a fusion will always exist. And I, I like to call myself a fusion musician because it really upsets people. But it's kind of true also. I grew out of rock and roll. My twin brother Alex and I were rock and roll obsessives from the ages of like maybe 11 until maybe 16. After Dwayne Allman died, I kind of lost interest in blues rock that I was so into. You know, Jimi Hendrix was my first inspiration to really play. And I started listening to John Coltrane. And, and around this time, it was 1971, this was when jazz rock, so-called, before it was called fusion, was really being born and coming into its own. This is the beginning of Weather Report. This is the beginning of Mahavishnu Orchestra. 
uh, Return to Forever, all these bands and bands already existing like Oregon and certainly Miles from In a Silent Way all the way in, into the mid 70s. And then progressive rock became really important to me. So I sort of grew away from rock rock and blues rock and got into these long form, much more, I guess, musically varied and I guess we could say academic. But you know what I'm saying? It's like there's just a lot more going on then. And that was where fusion started. And then fusion became this this word that was the ultimate pejorative term for music in the 90s, in the indier than thou 90s. And that's when I started calling my trio a fusion band because it really, really angered and upset people. But it really is and was a kind of fusion music. And everything I do is because I'm not a straight ahead jazz guy. I'm not a bebop guy. I can't play that music to save my ass. And although I do love straight ahead jazz, I'm definitely not the person to play or weigh in on that music in any deep way because I'm also influenced by rock and roll. You know, the influence even on me when I made Angelica, which we just listened to fives and sixes from, I was really, really intensely immersed in Sonic Youth's music and listening to, well, I had been listening to the Minutemen and all this music that that changed my view of where rock was at, where it was going. And it was very inspiring to me. What I wanted to do was make this record to be an homage, a love letter, if you will, to all this music that I'd been grappling with all the way from the late 70s up until this point, maybe 87, and then move on from there and do something a little more explosive and I guess noisier and more rocky or something. I don't know. But that's where I was going. I was going into what now you hear on, say, a Nels Klein Singer's record or whatever. And that's a kind of fusion. Well, you might consider your own knowledge of historical jazz and ability to play that pale in comparison to other people you've met who are very, very steeped in that. But compared to everybody in the rock world that you deal with, like you're working from a nice historical base. I mean, all the way back to 1910, kind of <laughs> to later classical stuff. So that's, that's great. That's what fusion, the same thing that happened to progressive rock happened to fusion is that the era that it got popular now, like people just use that to refer to that time to, to refer return to forever and the yellow jackets and whatever. And progressive <laughs> rock is 1974 and the free improv players. I've interviewed a number of people that have been involved in King Crimson in one way or another or descended from them. I don't know if those guys have the deep, you know, actually see themselves. They, they don't use the Metheny chords. They are not rooting themselves back to Herbie Hancock and Davis and Duke Ellington, etc. It's a et different harmonic language yeah. and it's a different aesthetic, for sure. But the thing that it shares is the wide openness of possibilities. And I think that for a mutt like me, that's the only thing that makes sense. It's just, it's not too confining because I'm some kind of wizard. It's too confining because I already heard all this other music. When I was 10 years old, I heard Ravi Shankar in my elementary school class and I was changed forever. You know, I mean, it just it was too late for me to think about, oh, gee, is that cultural appropriation now? If I refer to that music, you know, well, it's just too bad. I, I'm just going to refer to it anyway, because it's really what I want to listen to. It's what I want to hear, even in my own music, in its own kind of touristic way. It's going to make me feel something good. Well, let's wrap up here with a quick introduction to I wanted to put one of your recent singles, Imperfect 10. We haven't heard the Nels Klein 4 that grew out of your dual guitar albums with Julian Lodge, adding a uh, bassist and drummer to this. This was one of the singles you had released. Uh, it kind of has that classic flavor, but it has grit on it. And it's just, it seems very meticulously put together with the dual guitar thing. Do you want to say a little about this before we say goodbye? Sure. It's funny that you mentioned this because my working title for this song was Jazz Fusion Composition <laughs> and um, Imperfect Tan because it's basically a 10 beat phrase. And obviously a joke about a perfect 10. And to me, the song fits into a, I guess, sort of a bag that I dip into pretty much on every record somewhere or in a, every band, which is a odd meter ostinato from the bass with some kind of line over the top and an excuse to blow over it on a groove. And so this song I, I see as being very uh, influenced by John Schofield and his, his language. He's one of my favorite musicians and he's a wonderful dude. And it just uh, is the, sort of the only excuse on the Nels Klein 4 recording to do something almost rockin'. 
All right. Well, thanks so much for doing this. Is there anything that's been brewing during the pandemic that you've been able to start putting together? Oh, yeah. Obviously, I'm dreaming about doing some singers concerts at some point, but might be a little while. I got a grant to write and perform music with a quartet that I formed in Brooklyn before this all started, this pandemic thing. So obviously we can't perform it, but I wrote a bunch of music for what I'm calling the Concentric Quartet, which is a saxophone, acoustic bass, drums, and guitar band with Ingrid Laubrock on tenor saxophone, maybe soprano saxophone, uh, Chris Lightcap on the acoustic bass, Tom Rainey, who you may recognize from the Nels Klein for, among other billions of great jazz projects on the drums and yours truly on guitar. So I'm hoping to record and perform that music as soon as possible. And then, you know, the rest of the, what I've been doing is just a little this and that, a little solo here and there, some collaborations, uh, little workshops, as they call them, online, and just trying to keep it together. I'll link to some various projects that you've played on. I saw you, besides all these things that you're a band member of, or uh, leading that I saw on your website, you did stuff on the recent Joan Osborne recording, uh, some John Zorn, some ver- the the, Rain- the Wainwrights, uh, lots and lots of things. So I like to try to listen to everything that an artist has done. I couldn't even, I'm sure I barely scratched the surface. <laughs> well, I mean, there are a bunch of records out there, mostly kind of singer songwriter where I play like maybe on a song or two. Uh-huh. There's a bunch of those. Yeah, a few of those happened in the last year. Excellent. Well, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, you too. Thanks so much for your interest and for your incisive questions.
Jason Lush Nels, a great body of work there. You can hear more of him at nelskline.com. And I hope you'll go to nakedlyexaminedmusic.com to subscribe directly to the podcast. And while you're there, look in the upper right, there's a rate and review box. And click on that, it'll walk you through how to leave a review on Apple Music or somewhere else. And of course, if you're using Apple Music on your phone, if you just go to the store page there, you can leave a star rating without having to touch a computer at all. Any help you can give publicizing this thing would be greatly appreciated. And of course, I'd also love your financial support at patreon.com slash nakedlyexaminedmusic, which will give you ad-free versions of these episodes, plus my show notes, so you can see all the little picky things that I didn't bring up with a guest. My next guest will be Steve Almas from Beat Rodeo, The Suicide Commandos, lots of solo stuff, then violinist David Cross, ex-King Crimson, and most recently I interviewed Rob Abernathy who's a great acoustic guitarist, very honest folk songs, but has also recorded a lot of video game soundtracks. So we talk about both those things. Hope you'll come back and join me. Thanks so much for listening. Please support these artists. But most of all, keep on musicking. Until next time, this is Mark Lintzmeyer signing off. <laughs>